Welcome back to the Gruber Companies. Uh, this is our uh, Tesla uh, EV broadcast every Tuesday and Thursday. I'm Pete Gruber. I'm Mark Schaffner, and welcome to the Gruber Morning Show. Got a bunch of platforms. We want to welcome all of our uh, viewers. It's on a variety of different uh, social media sites, and uh, you're really what make these podcasts fun and interesting. We love your questions. Uh, let us know where you're coming in from if you have a question. And uh, today's uh, subjects are broad EV, and uh, one of the things that uh, we thought we would start with is the uh, the image behind us. It is an AI-generated image, and the reason we have a Lucid uh, behind us is uh, because we're going to be talking about a Lucid video that uh, we are ready to launch within the next couple of days or so. Um, the um, What I asked AI to do was give me a Lucid factory with a car out front and a bunch of people. And um, I should have been more specific. I, I think with AI, you have to tell it how many people you want, you know, because it's going to make up its own uh, judgment about what you're thinking. Yeah. And uh, But it did fulfill the car somewhat, and um, it does look like a beautiful building. Um, the, uh, uh, the reason that we uh, have a lucid theme today is because this video that we're releasing addresses the, first, uh, the second quarter financials this year and some what we feel are misconceptions in the industry regarding uh, the interpretation of what those uh, financials mean. And uh, so Mark Schaffner, our CFO uh, for the $30 million uh, Gruber companies and his staff had uh, worked on a analysis of this and um, we're going to be presenting that within the next uh, couple of days or so on our YouTube site as a uh, lucid uh, video. Yeah, I mean, we uh, some of the some of the analysis seemed to be a little bit alarming about uh, you know as Lucid on the brink of failure and stuff like that. So we felt it would behoove us uh, both in terms of the EV spectrum and because of my experience in the finance area with uh, running this company to get our take our own take, take an honest look at what the numbers are saying and what the interpretation is of those. It looks like we're going to... We're going to gonna adjust uh, Instagram real quick. Okay. Uh, so you're seeing the back of Richard's hair. And uh, we were actually uh, joking a couple of weeks ago how quickly Richard's hair grew. When he started here a year or so ago, he was he looked not quite like me, but kind of like Mark, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I could date myself here, but uh, Richard looks a little bit like Grizzly Adams. Ah, Okay. Have you ever been uh, told that before, Richard? I've... Yeah? Yeah, I can see that. Jesus. Yep, yep. Yeah, uh, Wolver Wolverine. Wolverine and Jesus, although Grizzly Adams, that's, you know, Grizzly Adams is, uh, you have to look him up sometime. He's going to be before your time. It's more like when I was a kid and one of the guys that was on uh, TV and had a little TV, family-friendly TV show. Well, we may have just helped Richard decide what kind of costume he's going to select for Halloween this year. Then. Very possible. <laughs> very possible. You know, one year I did Jon Snow, but I shaved my beard a couple days beforehand, not thinking ah, that oh. I would need the beard for the costume. Yes. All right. Uh, the other thing we wanted to cover with you before the questions start streaming in is uh, there was a uh, epic IPO uh, within the last week. And uh, again, in the EV world, it uh, seems like you can do no wrong. A, chi a uh, yeah, Chinese, a Vietnamese company called VinFast uh, had its opening um, IPO, uh, the initial public offering. It was a SPAC type um, uh, process. And uh, what, what happened was it shocked, I think, the world because they, um, the uh, first day after the IPO, they became larger than Ford. GM, BMW, and Volkswagen in one day. That's just, it, it's, it goes back to some of the, uh, uh, I guess I'd call it irrational enthusiasm. Yeah, there you go. That's a good <laughs> phrase. That's, that's, uh, that's one way I think Warren Buffett would have said those things. By the way, a SPAC is a, a special interest acquisition company. Basically, it's a shell company. It's put out and made into a public entity through its own IPO. And then that, uh, special in, that special purpose company, it exists mainly to go find somebody to buy. Mm -hmm. So in this case, this special purpose company uh, 
went and bought VinFast. And bought is a very loose term. It's what happens is that the two companies will merge, the private company and the public company. Mm -hmm. The uh, private company name is the one that gets retained. And, uh, and so it's a very um, efficient and less expensive way for a private company to go public. And much faster. You know, we've looked into our own uh, possibility of doing an IPO right. underwriting, and the amount of paperwork and time it takes to get the underwriting process done is pretty lengthy. This allows a company to simply merge with someone that has already done all that work, and the next thing you know, you've got a, a valid, uh, you know, um, you've got a valid IPO. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, looking at trying to go public for a company anymore, if a company doesn't have about $150 million or so in revenue, they say, you know, it's it's just too expensive for you to even go down that road. Don't bother, yeah. Don't, don't even bother. But some of the numbers here are, um, the um, uh, when the SPAC, of course, opened, and that was in 2021, it was uh, $10 uh, when it went public, mm -hmm. which is what SPACs, I think, normally start at. Is there a reason for that number, by the way, the $10? I, not really. It's a nice round number. That's, okay. That's okay. about the only reason. And of course, if you do any investing uh, and you get wind of the fact that a SPAC may be merging with a large company, that creates a lot of speculations. And sometimes you see these SPACs before they even merge start to take off. Yes. And there's also a lot of disappointment because if it was a rumor, it wasn't true, then, you know, it comes down just as quickly. But anyway, um, by the time the IPO occurred, it started at $22. And that same day on Tuesday, uh, this week, it went up to 3706, 270% higher than the SPAC price, 68% higher than the Tuesday opening price of 22. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, incidentally, it's down, uh, it was down about 20% on day two, and so far today it's down almost another 10%. Yeah, and we don't give, in, uh, we don't give investment advice, but we were speculating a couple of days ago, ah, oh, it looks like a good short position, doesn't it? And yeah. now we're kicking ourselves saying, well, that was true, you know, why didn't we act on it? Well, you remember Rivian, right? They went oh, yeah. through, when yeah. they went public, they started out at about $75 on their share price, and they went public at 75 within a day, they were up around 100 105 went as high as almost 115, and then they crashed. Yeah. They went down as low as $15 before they started to come back, and they're up around $20 to $25 now on a regular basis. I think they were over 140 Over 140 at yes. one point? Yes. But anyway, there you yeah. Go. yeah, that's very possible. Today it was like $21 a share. Again, this is not an investment uh, you know, uh, podcast, but uh, we do like to dabble in it. Um, then they say, meanwhile, BMW and Volkswagen are both worth around $69 billion, um, and uh, Ford, $48 billion, GM at $46 billion, and then Tesla, by, um, by uh, market capitalization, is still the world's largest automaker at $739 billion, and then its Chinese rival, BYD, is fourth place with $93 billion in valuation. Um, Pretty interesting uh, uh, change. By the way, Vin, um, uh, yeah, I didn't say this, but uh, VinFast is, uh, as of the $37 valuation per share, was worth $85 billion. So a little Vietnamese startup company is worth almost as much as BYD. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I being a numbers guy, I thought I'd run a few numbers and, and research a few numbers as well with the help of Barron's. Thank you, Barron's. Uh, they, I got a, I did get it, some interesting stuff. So first, VinFast, of course, sells uh, a crossover SUV. And Jesse, if you wanted to pull up the, uh, the VinFast VF8 in the background, we could, while I'm talking about this, people can see what that uh, little SUV looks like. Now, uh, based on the first day stock price, in fact, even based on the, the price right now, my opinion is that the company is still vastly overvalued. Um, here's why. The company is worth about $4.4 million per car sold so far this year mm -hmm. if those car sales were annualized. Um, they're worth, based on their production capacity, they can produce about uh, almost uh, 30,000 cars a year right now with the plants that they have. Um, they're based $300,000 a car is the valuation of this company based on production capacity. Now, if we compare this with another startup, let's, let's use Rivian. Rivian's currently worth about $275,000 per car delivered on an annualized basis. So not 4.4 million, it's mm -hmm. you know 5% of that. 
Uh, Rivian is worth about $93,000 per car based on their production capacity. So it's, it's, and you look at Rivian versus this one, this company, it's apples, you know, almost an apples to oranges. Rivian has as good a chance of, as a startup of being successful as any of the startups out there, probably a better chance than most. But going for it, VinFast can produce up to 300,000 cars a year with their current plant capacity. VinFast also has sold about 11,300 cars worldwide so far this year. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they're uh, a new company that hasn't sold anything yet, mm-hmm. like Rivian was when they were first coming out, or Lucid, or Fisker, or many of these others. And um, they have about 850 cars that they've sold so far this year in California. They're in the process of rolling out their sales to the United States. Um, They also have a pretty strong backer. So, um, you know, we talk about Lucid having the Saudi Arabian PIF fund and these other funds backing them. We talk about Rivian with the Amazon deal and the 100,000 vans, and that's how they get backed. Tesla back in the day was backed personally by Elon Musk's fortune. And uh, Vinva- Vin, um, yeah, Vinfast. Vinfast, I'm sorry, uh, has been backed by a uh, place in Vietnam, and uh, it's called Vin Group. And it's a large conglomerate corporation in Vietnam that is backing and financing this particular company. Interesting. So there is, there is somebody with deep pockets behind the company. Mm-hmm. To me, the success or failure of the company is going to be based on what you see on the screen. Mm-hmm. Does their car work? Does it drive well? Does it have a nice look and feel? So far, the automotive reviews on this car are pretty mediocre. Really? They talk about how it's a nice enough car. It's, it's a little overpriced for this kind of SUV. The range is okay, but the build and trim and look and feel when you actually take the car out and drive it, uh, car and track, auto driver, uh, they, they, were, um, they were unimpressed. Underwhelmed. Interesting. Kind of underwhelmed, yeah. So we're talking about valuation based more on speculation. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. One video to check out for sure is, um, oh my goodness, I need to go find it. Never mind. Give me, give me two right. minutes. There's a specific you group, Donut Media. Donut Media did a review on it, uh, and they are known for their uh, straightforward and brutal honesty on it, and it was on, on their reviews. Um, they didn't really hold any punches on it. Okay. Okay. Good to know. We've got a bunch of questions here. Um, yep. uh, YouTube to be announced. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. Um, he says, good afternoon, gentlemen. Likewise, good YouTube afternoon. Real Garner says uh, from Seattle, Washington, in the middle of the road trip across the country at this point. Uh, might that be in a Tesla vehicle? I'm wondering, Real Gamer, is, uh, is that? And good morning and welcome. In fact, he says, I got a Tesla Model 3, but I'm highly interested in VinFast. Okay. It's- uh, you Oh, a Highlander Apparel is with us again from YouTube. Welcome back. He says, just installed about a dozen superchargers near me in Metro Toledo. Smelling the opportunities here. Okay. I, I'm, I'm wondering uh, how many of those cars that come are going to be Teslas or how many are going to be other brands of vehicles. Good point. Yeah. <clears throat> in fact, that's probably one of our other, um, um, one of our other talking points. Fiskers just announced that they're also going to adopt the NACS standard. Yes. You know, I'm glad that they are. Um, <laughs> my, my thought on that particular one, you know, it's, it's, to a certain extent, it's not even uh, newsworthy because so many EV companies have announced that they're going to be uh, adopting the NACS standard. But at the same time, I'm glad to hear that because, first, Fisker does not have the financing to be able to put together their own network and they're going to be now going to the best network in the United mm-hmm. States. Uh, and second, I think it's going to, uh, in the not too fu- distant future, be the odd man out, as it were, or the EV company that you don't take seriously that doesn't have an NACS mm-hmm. uh, charging capability. And you know, there's, um, there's a long-standing relationship between Fisker and Tesla back over a day. Uh, uh, you yeah. need your mic up on you there. All right, that that's better. 
So, yeah, Fisker and Tesla, at one point in time, there was some collaboration taking place. It didn't end real well, but at the same time, uh, there was a relationship, and it looks like uh, they're coming back together in some form, at least. Yeah, adopting glad to the see standard. that. Yeah. Very much glad to see that. Um, so, Jared Crano on Instagram says, Did you see the Tesla charging tweet yesterday with the OG Roadster? Yeah, I've got that picture. I'll pull it up for you guys. Oh, you got please, yeah. Here, there you are. There we go. Make that a little bit bigger. That is a pretty little roadster. Yeah. You know, there is a way that you can convert a Tesla roadster to DC fast charging. And uh, this must be one of those, or it was staged and uh, pretending to be charging, which, by the way, I must admit we've done as well. And it's a great TikTok video, you know, when you bring your roadster over and then try to plug in and say, oh, I guess this doesn't work, does it? You know? But uh, this may be one of those conversions. It, um, there are a couple of issues with that. One is uh, the firmware does not know how to respond to 100% DC charge because normally the Tesla Roadster gets DC charging from the regen braking. It's not 100% duty cycles because, you know, it's only when you're braking. And uh, the firmware really and the cooling system, it's questionable whether it can handle that constant DC charge. The second problem with it is there is um, the, um, uh, the Tesla service centers. There are certain types of service that they won't perform on your roadster if you've had this conversion. And uh, one in Connecticut, for example, the customer needed a replacement battery. He had this conversion package put in for fast DC charging, and he ended up having to remove it because Tesla would not put in that, um, uh, that new 3.0 battery or do that replacement until he removed all of the aftermarket stuff. And, you know, from their viewpoint, they don't want to be liable or responsible for any kind of failures, especially with a $30,000 um, $30, pack replacement. Well, especially also if they know that that uh, cooling system is not necessarily built to handle the kind of uh, heat load that you're going to put in through DC fast charging. Right. Although you look at this picture fairly closely, uh, this is staged. You think um, so? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Look at the charging station that's behind the driver's side of the Tesla, and you see that black line uh, next to the red, and that's a charging cable. It's still plugged. It's still just oh, uh, hanging perfect. on the <laughs> hanging on the charging station. See, so. um, I can't wait to come back next week. By the way, I'm having LASIK surgery tomorrow. Finally, yes. I can't see the things that he's seeing. Oftentimes, you know, that's why our question font is like 150 font size, because I can't see that far. So, but yeah, you're right. Now that I'm looking, I can kind of see the charge cable still hanging there. Um, but yeah, it's uh, almost convincing, but not quite. It, it looks pretty close. I like the picture and of course, love the Roadster. That, that's a... Yeah. That's a great picture of the Roadster. And the color combo is perfect, too. You've got, you know, the red and white charger with the red accent. Same thing on that Roadster. By the way, any of you interested in getting a side decal like that on your Roadster, we have successfully been uh, recreating those. And uh, we were surprised by the number of people that wanted that back on their Roadster or on their Roadster. You know, um, the reason that that is on there is in the early days of Roadster, before the Model S came out, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking about 2008, 2009 time frame. Um, if you had a Tesla Roadster, invariably people were asking you, what is that? Well, it's a Tesla. Well, um, but who makes it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, those are common questions. But um, so a lot of people ended up putting the logo on the side just to make sure that they wouldn't get inundated with questions. That's a what, a, what a great take. I didn't know that, Pete. Uh, on TikTok, Jason DeFoss says, hello, friends, watching from Canada. Thank you for joining us. TikTok, Ethio EV Tech says, hello, guys. I'm your fan from Ethiopia. Well, thank you. Yeah. Glad to have you on and good afternoon. Uh, Instagram, Jared Crano says, special purpose. Uh, yeah, I think it was, uh, I think that's what I said. A Spock is a special purpose acquisition company. Yes. That, yeah. If we're going back to the earlier, uh, uh, discussion about the, uh, IPO for VinFast. Yes. Uh, Instagram, Stan Fox, uh, he says, what about Maruti Suzuki? Martial artist? Our company? Uh, well, Suzuki made their cars. Uh, have, there's the Suzuki motorcycle and then the car company. You think of uh, 
the small Suzuki Samurai, a Jeep-like vehicle in the late 80s that was a huge hit until uh, it was found from the consumer or the NHTSA when they did their highway safety tests. If you take a corner at you know 15 miles an hour and that thing it had a tendency to roll over. Oh, no kidding. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was basically that killed the market for it and it's now a, a, a collectible car as a result. Mm-hmm. Um, YouTube, uh, Crunch to Grace Hopper, uh, like number three in Newport Beach, SoCal. Caught up soon. Uh, smash it, he says. We just watched Brian White's take on Lucid. Uh, Hufa, he said, it was initially hopeful on VinFast, <laughs> but have not heard much promising info since. Uh, Clueless, and I'm not sure what WS would be. Uh, Wall Street. Wall Street oh, Wall speculation. Street speculation. Okay. Thank you for helping us with Thank those you. acronyms. Yeah, there was one yesterday that I looked at, and uh, I thought, JK, is that his initials? And he goes, no, I mean, he's just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't do a lot of that texting. You know, my granddaughter knows all of those acronyms. They have a whole bunch. Oh, yeah. Oh, All yeah. I know is LOL. You know, that's about it. Well, real quick, uh, too, for, mm-hmm. for Crunch, keep an eye out on our main uh, YouTube channel because we'll have Mark's official take on the uh, the Lucid stuff with all the, the facts and numbers and a, a, a real um, financial breakdown on that coming fi- out soon. A financial analyst. Another thing with Crunch, though. Always faithful. He reminds us to remind the audience, smash that like button. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah thank you, right. Crunch. YouTube Real Garner says LASIK is the best. I got it too. You know, these guys were teasing me the other day. Um, I came in after having my initial, um, uh, you know, analysis done for the surgery, of course. Uh-huh. And uh, <clears throat> so the following morning, I came in. We had a podcast, and I said, "Yeah, guys, I'm going to do it." And it looks like I'm going to save some money because they're only going to do one eye. And these guys immediately assumed that I was cheaping out I've again. Ever heard. <laughs> It's so much cheaper, though, guys, you know. No, what they did was they talked me into something that makes more sense from their viewpoint. Since one of the eyes is able to see close up better and one can't see far or vice versa, I forget what it was. What they're going to do is only do my farsightedness, correct that in one eye, and it's the best eye for that. So, you know, I have to trust their judgment. And they said, you know, if you don't like it, later on we can always do the other, um, we can do the other eye too, so... Yeah, yeah, that's but but we've gotten a lot of mileage out of that piece. We we have yes, and I'll tell you, it took me. Uh, I'm 72. It took me until this age to finally decide I'm going to let somebody cut on my eye. Now, of course, they rephrase that. They have a euphemism. Oh no, it's not quite cutting. It's a laser, and uh, but yeah. you know, I still think that there is some tissue redistribution involved in this, as in cutting. Well, the, or vaporization. <laughs> one of <laughs> yeah, one <or> two. <laughs> but you know, the part that finally sold me was I always envisioned when you get this kind of surgery, there's this gigantic needle like at the dentist mm-hmm. that comes and goes in your eye. And that just, you know, I mean, I have nightmares about that. Turns out that they have these drops that numb your eye and all you're going to feel is pressure, they say. And then you go ahead and tell them what was the number on uh, how many this doctor's done? Oh, um, the doctor that I chose, not the $35,000 operation doctor, I chose the $68,000 no, no uh, oper- or, uh, number of operations. operations yeah. Number of operations. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. God, I hope it's not that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the doctor that had done sixty-eight thousand operations. Yep, he's he's the one that's going to do it tomorrow. And uh, they say that uh, you know you just can't go swimming for a month. Um, I don't do much of that right now, anyway. But um, they say by the next day uh, you'll have close to twenty-twenty vision or better, even. Wow. Looking forward that's to it. That's pretty cool. We do have another quick comment from Highlander about the LASIK, so we'll get to that one real quick. All right. Uh, Yeah, he says, I've had LASIK surgery. You won't be doing podcasts for a while, he says. You will need those sunglasses. Uh, We'll pray for you. Glad I did it. Oh, really? Yeah, they didn't mention anything about sunglasses, but of course I wear them all the time anyway, so that, that's going to work out good for me. Yeah, I and the the part about not doing the podcast for a while, I'm sure you'll probably be back on Tuesday. Oh, I'll be here if I can see or not, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't, that one's one I just don't see happening. We'll have to have some Braille up there if it doesn't work out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, TikTok, Warren Bradford says, what is your guys' opinion on the Tesla Semi? Is it worth it? My gosh, yes. I mean, <clears throat> just the, um, the, the, the lack of parts compared to an ICE, Peterbilt, uh, you know, diesel-type yeah. long hauler. It is so much simpler. 
And of course, the main reason for doing all of this is to get rid of emissions. And, um, you know, there was a statistic that we used to bounce around that long distance transport in the United States alone was responsible for so much more, uh, you know, type harmful emissions than even car traffic. Yeah, if I remember right, and uh, and people out here can correct me, uh, even even Richard or or um, or Aaron can correct me. I believe a long haul trucker that's that's busy doing his job throughout the year is going to end up putting out as much emissions as like six hundred cars or something yeah. like that. So I, I'm very very bullish on the Tesla semi. Hearing recently that the the semi range is in the line in line with what they said it would be. Uh, Pepsi takes them 450 miles. They have the quicker charging that goes on. And of course, being the battery electric, you don't have any of the emissions. And then, uh, oh, th- what was it? Three weeks ago, I think, we saw that video of a uh, of a Tesla semi going up Donner Pass and just uh, fully loaded, passing other semis that were, you know, that were, I think in some cases, that I think there was one of those semis that was empty. And just yeah. the weight of the trailer made that semi slower than the Tesla semi. There are, I think, a couple of reasons <clears throat> that following a Tesla semi on an upgrade is going to be enjoyable as much as it can be anyway. Because one, they're going to be able to keep up with the speed limit. It's going to be safer. Yeah. yeah. Safer, yes. You're not going to be passing as much. And secondly... No fumes. I mean, how often have you been behind a vehicle that's chugging? And if you've got your windows down or you have recirculate off, you're bringing in all of those hydrocarbons into your cabin. Oh, yeah. City buses are the worst. <clears throat> they are, yeah. Especially when you're sitting on the wrong side of them on the side. I, mm-hmm. I've, I've done that in a Tesla Roadster convertible, and you and you basically have to hold your breath until the light turns green. It's that bad. Oh, 100%. Terrible. It was the same thing on the motorcycle, except the fumes would get into the helmet. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I would and have swirl. to, and I would have to flip up the visor and kind of move my head to try to get some fresh air. It was, it was rough. Yep. YouTube Seth Love says morning from Cali. Thank you for joining us. And uh, YouTube Highlander Peril. He said I felt nothing on my surgery, and I hope so. Thank you for that uh, vote of confidence. Um, so um, <clears throat> we've got another news item here. <clears throat> this one is a um, Cora comment or a thread. And um, he says, I've read a few comments on other threads from people who seem to believe that EVs are more expensive to own for those looking for a reasonably priced secondhand vehicle. He says, so he went to Auto Trader and he did some analysis using current car pricing. The short version, he says, electric vehicles are cheaper for motorists, sometimes much cheaper. And then he gives a long list of reasons. Um, <clears throat> one of those was, he has some caveats. He said he put himself in the shoes of someone looking for a no-frills, low-cost motoring, looking for a car. And the criteria was no older than three years, so three years or newer. No more than 30,000 miles. Buying from a main dealer or car supermarket, no funny car categories. Well, this is one I disagree with, and you've probably heard my rant before. Do not buy used cars from dealers. You never know what you're getting. You're not going to be able to talk to the previous owner who had the car. And most, some people take their lemons, their unsuccessful modes of transportation, and dump them with a dealer and trade into something else, or trade up or down or whatever. So <clears throat> by buying from a private individual, you have a number of advantages. And the most, um, the best one is that you're able to go to their house. You can see how they live. You can see what other vehicles they have and how they take care of them. And you can get a straight story as to why they're selling it. Right. <clears throat> the other reasons are by buying from a private individual, you can negotiate price <clears throat> much easier than you can with a dealer. You're not going to have dealer prep charges thrown on that and all the other hidden costs that they try to stick you with. And if you're, if you're buying from a private individual, you don't have to pay sales tax in most states, and which could be sizable with a $20,000 car with a, you know, mm-hmm. 8 to 10% uh, you know, sales tax in various states. So my advice always is if you're going to buy a car, do your homework first 
and then find private individuals. And there are plenty of places to buy. Offer up Craigslist. It used to be the um, uh, the newspapers. You go into the want ads. Oh yes, you know. Well, and and even on <laughs> Auto Trader and Cars dot com, there are individuals that list there, but you do have to filter for those individuals. I really agree with you, Pete, on this though. The uh, you know you've you've got to kind of know your stuff a little bit mm -hmm. as far as what you're looking for and about the uh, about the private individual. But your chance to get a better deal and a better quality car, I think in general is as good, if not better than going through a dealer where they're going to jack up the price by an additional $2,000 because they paid a mechanic for 15 minutes of time to look at the car to make sure it starts. And because they paid their car wash guy, uh, some kid either working his way through college uh, for an hour's worth of time to wash the car pretty up and back in the inside. And some detailing. And then of course, these are businesses they have to operate with profits. Right. So they're, they're going to have to mark up the vehicle, which you could easily buy yourself at a reduced rate. So anyway, that was the third item or the, the third caveat that he had. And that's one I disagreed with. But he says the fourth one now, he says, do approximately 10,000 miles per year with a commute less than 100 miles. So anticipate this for your purchase. Expecting 70,000 miles from the car before selling it. Uh, so don't keep it forever, in other words. Mm -hmm. He said, I looked on, on um, okay, Auto Trader for a battery electric vehicle, a vehicle and ICE cars in the city. And um, also uh, the, um, uh, uh, looks like SUV categories. He says that the BEVs had to have at least 150 miles of range, according to Auto Trader, in order to give 100 miles of range in cold weather. All right, so he's factoring in the, yeah, uh, either okay. the heating or the cooling that you're going to have to do with an EV. Then he said, I used EV database for EV fuel consumption figures and Honest John for real world ice mile, uh, miles per gallon figures. For EVs, he assumed power of 60,000 miles. Um, is it night? on a time of used, I'm, I'm uh, kind of paraphrasing here, folks. Yeah. And it, you know, this yeah. is, these are choppy sentences. So if it sounds like I'm, um, I'm losing my mind, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the way I'm reading it. Um, he says for ice, he assumed petrol, and obviously he's in Europe, gasoline at $1.50 or uh, $1.50 per liter. All right. I think here's where you were going to take over. Yeah, I mean, um, he is. He had talked about his assumption of insurance, taxes, residual values, and stuff would be roughly equal. Um, you know, first, you know that uh, on ICE vehicles here in the United States, insurance is a little bit less than for electric vehicles. Um, you have the ability when you're charging at home to have the different time of use rates at home. Um, are are the electric vehicles cheaper overall? He says yes. I completely agree. I, I, I really completely agree because um, if somebody who has an ICE vehicle comes to me and says, yeah, but what about that battery? You know, you're going to, that, that's one of the more common arguments that I read about for people who do not like the ICE vehicles. They say, well, in three to five years, you're going to have to replace the battery in the car. That's not true. We know that from personal experience. First, we have all these roadsters that are going with 15-year-old batteries. We get a fraction of those into our shop to do the repairs on those batteries. The vast majority of those are just running and very happy with the batteries that they have. And some of these are not, you know, we're not always talking about cars that have 1,500 miles. We're talking about cars that are 80 or 100 or 120,000 miles. Uh, the Model S that I drove until recently, it's now an 11-year-old Model S, and I had over 100,000 miles on it. Mm -hmm. There was nothing at all wrong with that battery. So the, even the eight-year idea of batteries is something that's, I think, uh, they call it average, but I think that's a, a low number. Um, so my reply to those ICE people, well, what about your engine and transmission? Mm-hmm. Right. There's you know, a huge expense. Frequently, transmissions need to be replaced on ICE vehicles at around 150,000 miles. Ford, especially with the Taurus, was famous for years about having a transmission that would not last more than about 75 or 80,000 miles. And that's a $3,500 uh, replacement every time it happens. So by the time you get a, a Ford Taurus to 200,000 miles, at which point you have to spend 4000 for a new engine, 
you've also spent $3,500 three times for a new transmission. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing, of course, to me is look at where batteries have come in the last eight years. Go back eight years, you're going back to about 2015. The Tesla Model S is fairly new, and if you needed a new battery for your Model S for any reason, you were paying $30,000. It was expensive. Now, Tesla themselves advertises anywhere in the eight to $10,000 range for a refurbished Model S battery, and as little as 16,000 to as much as 20,000 for a brand new Model S battery. Mm -hmm. Not cheap by any means, but at the same time, they're not nearly as expensive as they were. And with the warp speed that batteries are uh, being developed at and the battery technology is developing, I guarantee you in eight years, you will not see what you see today. What yep. you're going to see is gonna be far less. Looks like social media is coming our way. Oh, okay, we left it off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, he mentions cars that um, I'm not familiar with, like the Seat, M-I-I-B-E-V. -I -I -E it's a city car, and I looked it up. It's a, it's a small little car, kind of like the smart car. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and he said that um, the cheapest auto trader price was 10200 And again, within that criteria that we mentioned earlier. But yeah, this is obviously Europe because there's some other ones here, the Fiat Tipo, the Dacia Sandero, the Citroen C1, and uh, some that we would recognize, uh, you know, Ford, Nissan, and uh, the Corolla HEV. Yeah, well, even the MG ZS, that's a British car. Um, and it's only available over in Europe and Britain. But the Hyundai Kona is available here in the United States with a mm -hmm. 64 kilowatt battery. Uh, that would be a longer range SUV, and that was right in the middle of his list. There, there were uh, some cars cheaper, but uh, most of the ICE vehicles were still more expensive than the Hyundai Kona. Yeah. So his uh, fundamental point is that EVs can save a motorist money when you're replacing your car, which is an interesting change because we were all hoping for that tipping point when, you know, EVs become cheaper than ICE cars. Yeah. You know, when I, when I got into EVs was with the uh, 2015 Kia Soul. It was a little 90 mile, we call it, they would be now called a city driver. And the reason I did it was because the gasoline, which was around $2 a gallon at that time, I, 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 I'm a numbers guy. I've, I've been to that a couple times here mm -hmm. on the, on today. Um, I did the calculation out. Okay, what happens if gas goes up to 250? What happens if it goes down to 150? Well, it's probably not going down. It probably is going up. And I found out that the break-even point for me for the car payment that I would have versus the fuel and the oil and everything was about $2.30. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure enough, with uh, the, 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 the price fluctuated up and down a little bit, but by the time I sold that car and got my Volvo XC40, Gasoline had spent over a year up at between four and five dollars a gallon, okay. and with the commute that I have and my wife had, uh, that my wife has as a as a first grade teacher, we figure we're saving about six hundred dollars a month on just on fuel expense for the commute. Mm -hmm. um, and if we both had ICE vehicles with the amount that we commute right now, uh, we would probably uh, have at or higher than her car payment uh, in fuel costs. Just in fuel costs. Just sure. in fuel costs. Sure. Wow, the questions are starting to stream in. YouTube, to be announced. Welcome again. I sent you guys an email. Let me know if you had a chance to check it out. I included some photo and data. You know what? I did not get an email. Um, Assuming this would have gone to EV at Gruber, I don't have access to that one, so I can, I can ask uh, Nick later about that. Yeah, ev at gruber.com there to be announced. That would be the place to send it. Instagram, Arun Aaron Andrew 007. Is Tesla possibly in India for autopilot features? You know, a, a general answer is I think so. Yeah, I have uh, an answer to that. The, the reason they're saying that is because there's basically... It's crazy over there as far as the traffic laws and there's no lines on the roads, so it's very hard... For, uh, okay. uh, for autopilot to function. Um, it works there. As far as I know, you can enable it there. I don't know how well it works, but there are a number of companies that offer um, autopilot that are that are actually doing testing just in India specifically. And I would imagine Tesla might buy one of these at some point, or maybe, I'm not sure, but I know that their, their chief director of software for 
Tesla Autopilot is actually from India. So okay. um, I don't know what the status is exactly on that, but yeah, I can imagine it's pretty chaotic over there. Yeah, the Autopilot in most of the cars over here that have some sort of driver assist or Autopilot equivalent, a lot of the vehicles that are out there on the roads do have some sort of Autopilot equivalent, by the way, but they typically are relying on those white lines or something similar to that that you see that are so common both in Europe and in the United States. Yeah, interesting. You know, TikTok, Warren Bradford asks, uh, we're getting into LASIK here because I mentioned that earlier. I'm yeah. getting LASIK surgery tomorrow. He says, how much is your LASIK? It was uh, $4,000 for both eyes and only 2000 if you only do one eye. So I'm getting one eye. <laughs> and there's that, that second part of that do, question. Yeah. Do you need cataract surgery too? Um, you know, that was interesting because um, when the, um, uh, the optometrist was doing all of his measurements, it was about an hour and a half actually. He said, finally, after doing all this, he says, you know, your, your eyes are pretty amazing. You have the eyes of a 20-year-old, and I'm 72, so I was pretty pleased with that. He said um, that typically people that come in at my age, they have floaters, they have cataracts, they have some clouding, and then there's apparently something that's the size of an M&M behind your iris that is the lens that opens and closes. And uh, he said, mine look perfectly healthy. It's just that my eyes have shifted a bit. And with uh, this laser corrective surgery, I'm going to be a 2020 or better. That's fantastic. Wow. Uh, Des on TikTok <laughs> says, electric car owners don't pay highway taxes at the pump. Will there be repercussions to this? Short answer. And the reason I wanted to take that question is, yes, there will be. And there already have been. While Texas is kind of the standard bearer, uh, this is not at all unique to Texas. Most states are going in this direction. Texas now has a $200 per year registration fee for auto, uh, electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, and that's on top of their normal licensing fee. When you first buy the vehicle, there's a $400 fee. The whole idea of this is that that fee is meant to offset the loss in highway tax revenue that, people, that people pay at the pump. Um, the thing about that and the reason that it's effectively a, not just a tax equalization, but is a tax increase and a penalty to better electric vehicle owners is that the average person who owns a, an ICE vehicle pays about $67 a month in highway taxes in Texas. Mm -hmm. This same type of formula is going on across the United States. Uh, Iowa has a similar punitive bill, and there are now 36 states out of the 50 that have some sort of electric vehicle tax bill that's either already signed and going into effect or is in legislature being debated and is likely looking to pass. Sure. But we all knew they had to do it, and as the uh, uh, migration or the adoption rate continued to increase, that was, that was going to become more important. Yeah, so, so <clears throat> short answer, yeah, it has repercussions. A lot of those repercussions are being seen, and the government is getting theirs. They're going to end up with more revenue from EVs than they ever had from gas vehicles. YouTube Highlander Apparel, um, he says, I'm 58 years old. I've never bought a new car. Just did my research on what I bought or am, um, of what I'm about to buy, especially in these times of inflation. Is, is a PS another one of those acronyms that I'm unfamiliar with? Yeah, postscript. Oh, script. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, he says, kindness is still free. Scott Buchanan. Well, thank you for that uh, comment. Thank you very much. On Instagram, Bingo Jones 69 Aloha from Hawaii, island of Oahu. One of us here. Uh, we have solar panels on our homes and also at least two uh, T battery packs for storage. I'm assuming probably Tesla Powerwall battery packs for storage. Yeah. Uh, any idea of the longevity of these packs? Many thanks. Wow, that that's a good question. The um, in the uh, Tesla vehicles, uh, except for aberrations and you know uh, single cell failures or uh, plumbing issues or whatever it is that's uh, causing a problem in the battery pack, uh, the 2012 Tesla Model S's for the most part are still running and still going strong. So we've got at least 11 years so far. And our only experience with that is uh, anything longer would be the Tesla Roadster. Many 2008 Tesla Roadsters are still going strong with a pack that's 15 years old. And we're talking about the multi-cell 18650 type battery packs. Yeah, and you know, I just did a quick look up on this as well online. 
And uh, t uh, Tesla is saying uh, that on paper, the average lifespan of a Tesla Powerwall is around 20 years. Uh, it says, however, the number can vary based on exactly how you use that battery, how many times you deep discharge that battery. Um, and so there, some places are saying even as long as 24 years for a Powerwall battery for a lifespan. They seem to have readjusted then. But yeah, if that is the lifespan of a Roadster, then that's very encouraging to the Roadster community because at 15 years, they may have another five to seven years. Yeah. Now this is for a Powerwall for the... Right, but, yeah. but you're right. If the power wall is at 20 to 24 years, now that gives us even more confidence that the batteries in the Roadsters and in the Model S's and the Model Y's, because they're all made off of the same battery cells. Right. Yeah, those particular ones that you described, yes. TikTok, Snarg, says, social media is full of videos showing poor build quality for Teslas. In your experience, is that true or false? Um, it is true to an extent, and we actually did a video a couple of years ago, I think it was, and um, my, my basic comment in that video was electric vehicles, especially the Teslas, are exactly what this planet needs right now, but we have to remember something. You're not going to get the same kind of build quality from a Tesla or any new EV manufacturer that has not yet had decades to perfect their production processes and their uh, QC programs. Um, so things like panel gaps and paint issues at times are still um, haunting some of these new EV manufacturers. My advice back then two years ago was if you want a perfect car inside and out, go buy a German car. If you want, uh, if you want to save the planet, you're going to have to live with a few of these things. You know, the most interesting story that comes to mind here is in our service center, we currently have a vehicle that is for sale. Mm -hmm. It is Founders VIN number three, Model S. In the world of cars, you have your Founders series and you have a Signature series, and then eventually you start your normal VIN run. So this is one of the first cars off the assembly line. In fact, this particular car was actually on stage with Elon and George Blankenship when they were first releasing the Model S's to a large audience of people. And the owners of these cars went up on stage and they personally received their keys from Elon Musk. That car is here now, and it has panel gaps. The front, uh, um, uh, the front hood has a half-inch to five-eighths gap on the sides. The, uh, the rear trunk has gaps. And um, we happen to have the first mechanic at Tesla, employee number 194, I think. Yeah, something yeah. like that. He very, very, very early one. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, what is this about? You were there in 2012 when they released these cars. What are these gap issues all about? And he says, I don't know if I should say this on this podcast, but I'm going to do it anyway. He said, they hired an engineer to purchase the stamping machines to stamp out these type of body parts for the Model S. He came from the steel world, and these are aluminum. And aluminum relaxes after you stamp it, so you have to overcompensate when you do your stamping. Right. And that's it, as simple as it is. Um, this particular car, we asked the customer, do you want this fixed? Because he's selling it as a collectible. And we, um, we finally agreed it would not be a good idea to fix this because this is part of its history, part of its provenance, part of what makes this car so unique. Yeah, and we would be potentially altering... Uh, a collectible car, which we know is the, the, you don't want to do that at all with collectibles. Right. So the originality was important. Sitting right next to it, by the way, for those of you interested in purchasing a Founders VIN number three Model S, is a Founders VIN number three Roadster owned by the same customer. Won't tell you who it was, but it was somebody that was a VIP during the day. And uh, both of those cars are for sale. And equally so, on the Roadster, one of the hood vanes has the carbon fiber weave showing through the paint. Again, it could be fixed very easily, but why would you want to? It's part yeah. of its history and yeah, part of its provenance. You know, and when, when you talk about build quality, I, I'm going to have to agree with you there. I, you know, I've driven, driven in or ridden in several different Teslas, and the build quality kind of varies. Some of them are really, really good, and some of them, eh, not quite so much. Um, when my wife and I bought our second EV, it was a Volvo XC40 Recharge. Now, Volvo is a long time, uh, one of those decades old auto manufacturers, 
and they committed to go to all electric by 2030. So this was one of their earlier electric models, but it's been based on the XC40 ICE model that they have. It is uh, just stunning in its build quality, which it's Volvo. What, what would you? Yeah. What do you expect? Mm -hmm. You would expect something like that, and that's what we got. It, it, it's like a Swiss watch. Everything fits together perfectly. Everything is solid. Everything is is perfectly in place when it comes to the build quality. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't just love driving my Tesla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there there are a whole host of other advantages to Tesla. Um, so we hope we answered that question. Um, YouTube Highlander Apparel, if you guys can move that up just one line. There we go. He says, Ohio is already looking at heavy EV taxes. Yeah. Yes, yes. False Holtz on TikTok uh, answered Snark on the uh, build quality question. He says, I would be interested in their answer too, but I think Tesla has resolved a lot of build issues, at least for the Model 3 and Model Y. I'm I'm hoping so. I've heard anecdotally that people mm -hmm. are happy with the build quality. I know I know I've known some Model Y and Model Three owners, but at the same time, I also know that you go to the press, even press as of this summer, that says, "Yeah, if you really want that Model Three, uh, don't buy it for the build quality." Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they will continue to improve, folks. I mean, you know, as I said, they're decades-long manufacturers, and back in the early days, they probably had the same types of problems. Yeah, yeah. TikTok, Des, you're 72. What? I guess you're still in your 50s. Well, thank you. I get that often. Uh, and on Instagram, Salt of Stone says, how does the power wall cool? You know, I don't know that. Uh, Jesse, I've got a picture. Can you throw up repurposed bat? Yeah. Um, I was called three days ago by a company that uh, is um, repurposing used EV battery packs. And if you see that, um, uh, that building in the back, they're perfect. If you can zoom in, those are actually, um, I'm not sure if they're Model S battery packs, but what they do is they take packs out of collision damage cars, they stack them on these racks, and then they connect them together with some uh, battery safety management uh, software and equipment. And these now become the equivalent of stationary power systems. And what you're not seeing on the other side here is, and I wish I had the other picture, is acres of solar panels. And this is a company that has a pretty tall order. The balance of this year, they need to buy 1,000 more of these packs. Next year, it was like 3,500 packs. And that number continued to increase because they're wow. building so many of these sites and installations. My first question here is, how are they cooling it, just like you? And if you look at the front of this, I don't see a lot of plumbing. I see some uh, electrical connections. Um, and it could be that that is on the back. But in order to maintain any level of safety, these would have to have some form of thermal management, especially when you consider it's out in the sun and eventually closed up, and uh, you're going to be building some heat unless they have AC in these as well. You know, and uh, when it comes to cooling and uh, the heating of the battery pack in uh, a stationary power application, um, in general, these stationary power applications do not put the kind of heat load either in charging or discharging that you're going to see from an automotive usage. Right. So it may, it's, it may be possible that these guys have some sort of supplemental liquid cooling going on in the background with a, with a chiller or an air conditioner to cool the liquid, mm -hmm. and that that's all they need is just a pump with the liquid to, to cycle through those batteries continually. And it doesn't have to cycle at nearly the rate that it does when it's in a car. You're sitting six inches off of a 160-degree pavement going 70 miles an hour and trying to pull you know, 30 kilowatts an hour out of that, out of that battery pack. Oh, the pack, yeah. Um, real quick, guys, I have a, something for our Instagram. I'm just, I don't know how to pronounce the name, so I'm going to just call you Mem. But he said on Instagram, interesting, used battery packs as power station. Mem, if you're on Instagram, you're not going to see this image. So if you want to go to any one of our other platforms on uh, YouTube or TikTok or um, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, any of those platforms, you'll be able to see what's uh, normally on the green screen. We don't have that for uh, Instagram yet. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. By the way, our answer to this company looking for used battery packs is we just don't have the volume that you're going to need, you know, 1,000 for the rest yeah. of this year. Uh, for us, these battery packs are attached to a car, 
and uh, so there are no extras typically. And if we do get a collision damage car that's so bad that uh, it can't be put back on the road, we usually end up with a pack, but that typically goes back into another car to keep it running. Well, in fact, we typically are looking for battery packs ourselves right. because we're in the battery pack repair business. And uh, what else, what, what's better to uh, get a couple of bad modules out of a Model S and be able to replace them with good modules? Right. And, uh, and we balance them out and stuff like that. Now, having these guys... Uh, potentially pick up modules that would be deemed as quote unquote bad from the automotive standpoint, they, they still might be usable. Right. And then of course you don't, uh, you have another ingredient there, which is uh, you have to have a, um, uh, a newer style battery or something that doesn't have a lot of years on it. Because by the time you get done purchasing it, transporting it, installing it. And if it's a, if it's a 10 year old battery, that's only going to last a couple more years, you got a problem. So right. I'm sure they have a criteria, a strict criteria, what they'll uh, purchase or accept. TikTok question, Richard McFarlane589 asks, are you able to add supercapacitors between the battery and inverter to help the battery range? You know, these, um, these EVs are finely tuned machines with firmware and hardware expecting certain parameters. And the ability to insert, introduce, or modify is really constrained. So the simple answer to that is no. Although there is um, uh, a lot of new battery technology that's on the drawing boards and that is, uh, that's beginning to emerge that will eventually solve a lot of these problems in terms of range, um, you know, thermal event issues, uh, weight, all of that. Uh, fortunately, there's such demand for these EVs that, um, uh, you know, innovation is usually driven by demand. And there's an enormous amount of innovation and improvement taking place across the planet currently. You know, the, uh, I believe the Rimac Nevera, one of the supercars that's, that's out there and being developed, does have a combo of supercapacitors and battery. Uh, I, and I, it might not be the Rimac, but I have heard of this in the battery electric vehicle space. The, uh, the reason for it, of course, they're using it is for performance mm -hmm. because you can get electricity out of a capacitor more quickly than you can get electricity out of a battery. And so that uh, what we think of as instantaneous torque actually isn't instantaneous when it goes into the supercar territory. So in combination, you get better performance. Yeah. So in, 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 and that's how they do is that they, they do those in combination with one another. So YouTube, Martin Fisher from Switzerland, from Davos, uh, Switzerland, says usually car batteries get older faster because of the more extreme temperatures and higher discharge rates in a battery electric vehicle. So this is, again, comparing stationary power to, um, to the electric vehicles. Yeah, and I think I would agree with Martin. Uh, that's why when the battery manufacturers talk about it, um, they, so many of them prior to the, uh, lithium phosphate battery, the iron, uh, iron phosphate, uh, would say, don't charge your battery above about 90% because the amount of time that it takes to do that final charge is increased due to the amount of heat that's being dissipated mm -hmm. in the battery at that top 10%. The same type of thing happens at the bottom end of the range. When you get below 20% of your battery, your batteries actually start generating more heat, and that's part of what damages them. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got more questions here, but if we can insert something real quick, uh, Jesse's back. Can you bring up Lambo teaser? Um, we have. Um, I've gone on rants where I've complained about GM making a hybrid Corvette and Lamborghini making a hybrid Lamborghini instead of just you know biting the bullet and making an electric car and switching over. It turns out that uh, Steve Winkleman, the CEO of Lamborghini, has been watching our podcasts because they are now announcing tomorrow a fully electric Lamborghini. And this is the teaser that they're giving us before tomorrow's reveal. Now, um, I went to AI, and I've done this before with this, uh, with this uh, Tesla Model 2, or uh, yeah. I forget what the, yeah. Yeah, what they're they call called, it. nicknamed the Model 2, yeah. Yeah. And I asked AI, show us what this Lamborghini is going to look like. And here's what Mid Journey came up with. And it's called Lambo Electric, Jesse. There we go. Now, it does look like a Lambo, does it not? You know, even the medallion in the front and the angular lines and, uh, you know, the uh, sweeping uh, roof line and the scoops in the back. So 
let's we'll have to see what this uh, what they reveal tomorrow and whether it looks anything like this. Um, but again, our point or my point is, you know, it, it's it's um, creating a hybrid is a step backwards because you're not solving the emissions problem. And you're, um, you have only so much room in one of these sports cars. Why would you put an ICE uh, drivetrain and an EV drivetrain and make uh, twice the amount of maintenance for the customer than just simply biting the bullet and uh, creating an EV drivetrain for your uh, vehicles? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, uh, I'm excited to see what kind of art, and I do mean that this car is art, uh, that Lamborghini is going to come out with tomorrow. Uh, the one thing that would terribly disappoint me would be if Lambo, Lamborghini came out with an SUV. Oh, oh no, horrible, horrible. Or a station wagon, or, or a pickup truck. Or well, they a, already have the, the yeah, Euros, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and, that, and that's exactly what I'm thinking is, okay, they've got the Euros already. Uh, they've already gone down this road once with the hybrid. I sure hope that this new car that's all electric isn't one of their SUVs. It's going to be a Lamborghini electric truck. Watch. And, and, <laughs> well, you know, what we, what we don't know is the people that buy cars like Ferrari and Lamborghini, part of the experience is that symphony of sound that is emitted from the exhaust systems on these cars. And um, I don't know how the, their clients, expecting that to be part of the experience, are going to react to a perfectly silent car. Yeah. I, I was at a light this morning and I had one of these big diesel trucks, you know, that uh, had the chip in it and all that. And uh, he thought he was going to be fast off the line. And I had my little Tessa Roadster and I was gone by the time he even started to move. But it was perfectly silent. It was like total surprise is what I'm imagining. Yeah. Usually when something goes that fast, you're hearing a whole lot of sound and noise, uh, you know, along with it. And, uh, but anyway, it's going to be interesting to see what the adoption for these kinds of vehicles is going to be for their current customer base. By all means. On YouTube, PYGKLB has uh, joined us today. Uh, first, welcome back. I'm glad to have you here again. He says, I used to own a Taurus. When its transmission had to re be rebuilt at 125000 I felt hard done by. I guess I was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> you know, PYG, I, I'm speaking from experience, actually. I, I bought a Taurus at an auction. My wife and I were uh, d didn't have a lot of money, and we, we, we were able to get this Taurus for like 900 bucks. And, of course, we didn't know what we were doing. Our kids are small. We just needed transportation. So we're going home, and... You get the, the whole jerk thing mm -hmm. and take it in to, to find out what's going on. And uh, a rebuilt transmission, this is back in 2004, 2005. A rebuilt transmission was going to be $2,000. A new transmission was going to be 4000 It needed a transmission, either new or rebuilt. And the transmission place said, oh, you have 95000 on it. Well, you know, you're about 10,000 miles more than you would expect. Mm -hmm. So they literally, they told me between 80 and 100,000 miles, the Ford Taurus is going to need a new transmission and it's going to be every 80 to 100,000 and it's not unique to Ford. It's most cars that do that. And obsolescence. Yeah. yeah. YouTube, Highlander Apparel, he said, um, and I think he's talking about the, um, uh, the panel gaps we mentioned earlier and the fact that they were buying presses that were designed for steel rather than aluminum. He said, that's why I mentioned five thousand and six thousand aluminum it's used on teslas uh, rivian and lucid i recently worked at a toledo stamping plant until they hit me with a fork truck oh no way oh man that's that's kind of a scary thing highlander and uh, that's wow wow airless driver forklifts are pretty dangerous they can be Instagram, Ethan Mirza underscore zero zero four. He says, let me in, please. Jesse, is he getting a limited experience? I don't know what that one is in reference to, but you're, you're welcome in, I guess. Yeah, I, I have no idea what that was about, but you know, Ethan, come on in. Yeah, join us. Yeah, join us on YouTube if you want to see that image. You know, we, we, um, we keep talking about this, but uh, these platforms, streaming platforms, not all of them can handle a green screen. Uh, for whatever reason, it seems so simple, right? Yeah. But um, eventually they come around. TikTok used to be the same way, but now we're able to uh, put our 
content onto the uh, green screen. Well, and in, in some of our very, very early podcasts, Instagram was fine. Mm -hmm. They they changed their software, and the company that had the software that would allow us to do the green screen in the background didn't change. Mm -hmm. So they broke their interface, and I, I'm not sure if it's fixed yet. Instagram, uh, Memostad, uh, me says, interesting using used battery packs as power stations. You know, it's not, um, it's not new. The, um, there are solar people that um, will purchase collision damage model S's, for example, and then retrieve the modules that are in the battery pack. And there's 16 in an 85 kW pack, mm -hmm. about 22 and a half volts each. They would then put those into battery cabinets and go off-grid solar with those. And I also do not know whether any of them were considering thermal management in those. I don't know, and that, um, I mean, think about in today's world, the, the pickup trucks are doing uh, vehicle to home. Mm -hmm. So you've got a pickup truck, a, a Ford Lightning, or the new Chevy Silverado EV, or uh, in, the, in another year or so, the Ram Revolution, they're all talking about this. And uh, even there's rumors that the Tesla Cybertruck will do this. So you've got a, a battery that's 100 kilowatts, and they say, yeah, well, you can you can power your home for like two or three days on this if ne if necessary. So, how do you cool those batteries? Right. Yeah. You know, they're just they're just sitting in the car there, but the the car is going to have its own cooling systems and stuff already there. And the automotive, uh, the automotive use case is simply a a higher or more extreme use case than anything stationary, as far as I can tell. Yeah. During Hurricane Ian, there was a, um, a story circulating about somebody that owned an F-150 Lightning. Power was out at his house, and he plugged his freezers and fridges into that uh, Ford F-150, and he kept things alive for three days. Yeah, I totally, totally get that. Uh, YouTube, PYGKLB is with us again. He says, Oregon has higher hybrid registration fees and substantially higher electric vehicle fees. Uh, again, I think they're one of the 36 or so states that have already gone down that route or are in the process of going down that route. I personally think it's eventually going to hit virtually every state in the country because um, it, maybe it's this is a cynical me, Pete. At some point, the government politicians are going to realize we have a new revenue stream that is not going to be called a tax increase, and they're all going to go for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why not? Uh, YouTube Crunch, he says, and he's talking to Martin Fisher. He says, regarding battery heat degradation, I believe that the best, um, in essence, Tesla with Octavalve, et cetera, all have more than adequate battery pack cooling built in. Okay. I agree. Yeah, I, I really agree. Highlander Apparel on YouTube uh, gives us a, another great comment. Sandy Monroe says this over and over about hybrids. Just a waste. Oh, and get him started about hydrogen. That's another favorite subject of oh, his yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> Magic um, Aviator from TikTok says, is Rivian a good electric uh, vehicle, I'm assuming? You know what? We've got a story here that uh, I, is actually next in line, and it's regarding the Rivian R1S SUV which recently achieved something that has never been done before in the past. And that is, there's apparently a Rubicon trail in uh, Northern California, not too far from Sacramento, that the four-wheelers like to find uh, challenging to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, it is regarded as one of the premier off-road trails and one of the most difficult and um, they say that although it's uh, possible to complete the Rubicon Trail in about 8 to 10 hours for those who visit the area, they're advised to spend a minimum of two days because it's such a scenic place with stunning views, swimming areas, and places for serious rock crawling. Well, as it turned out, this Rivian SUV is the first electric vehicle to complete the Rubicon Trail. And... Um, they um let's see what else we have here it it was a quad motor r1s that completed the trail it was fully stock no modifications um including its 34 inch pirelli all-terrain tires the only additional equipment was a set of steel rock sliders front tow hitch and receivers and a roof rack there were uh they experienced no 
no mechanical failures during the two-day journey. It did not require a change of tires. And um, the, um, the, uh, the vehicle did sustain some honorary bumps and scrapes, as they say. Uh, and, and again, this is a trail that's located in the High Sierras, due west of Lake Tahoe, and approximately 80 miles from Sacramento. So we have our first record set for an EV doing this Rubicon Trail. And Jesse, if you could bring up Rubicon Trail 2... Uh, I wanted to um, get... The, yeah, I'll bring that up real quick. Do you think that's the stock uh, travel? You see that back tire in that? Look at how far that's going down. Yeah. Uh, it, they, was said it, they, uh, was they said it stock? was stock. Yeah. No. Now, this might be... This was a magazine article. This may be a stock image. So, uh, there we go. This is this is an image of a... Uh, I believe this is a Jeep Wagoneer from a few years back on the Rubicon Trail. This is what the trail looks like. Wow. Uh, so it is, uh, I, I went ahead and did a little bit of looking up because I, I've, I've got a friend who's a very much a four wheel drive enthusiast, um, and was, has told me, a, 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 you know, a little bit about the rock crawling. That's rock crawling is simply taking your car, your Jeep or whatever, and, and getting it up over these places that you would think are impossible to climb with, uh, you know, by hands and feet, much less with a vehicle. Right. Uh, so the Rubicon Trail itself, it is a world-renowned four-wheel driving trail. It starts in Georgetown, California, and goes over the Sierra Nevada mountains to Lake Tahoe. It's about 22 miles long. Uh, it's considered the premier off-highway vehicle route in the United States, and if not the most difficult, one of the most difficult four-wheel drive routes in the world to, take, uh, to go through. Um, and so the, most of that 22 miles that you go through is like this. Amazing. And there are people on the trail constantly with their, with their Jeeps and with their, you know, uh, lifted four wheel drives, their, their trail four wheel drives just to see if they can make it. Right. Right. And, then, and so. I see that one there too, Mark. That tire on the right is, um. On the left, our left, I guess, is deflated. It looks like a little bit too. You got to do that sometimes to get a yeah. better climb, I think. And then he's got that giant winch too. Yep. So that's crazy that that uh, Rivian made it through there just stock. You know what? What um, uh, the question that I have? It's a 22 mile trail, right? Mm -hmm. What if you break down right in the middle of it? You can't continue. Who's going to come get you? Well, you. You're you're probably going to be backing up traffic. Is that is actually what <laughs> like happens? <that> too. Yeah. <laughs> and every one of those pieces of traffic that you're backing up is going to be able to drive around you and winch you up where you need to go. Yeah. Because almost all of them will be equipped like this, where they'll have their own winches and ability to to help. But yeah, that's that's a good question. A complete and total breakdown, of course, is still a, a question. How would you do that? But yeah, you're right. They probably help each other, and a lot of winches on these vehicles. A lot I of would winches. Imagine. Well, the the one thing that I don't think you would see would be the tow truck from AAA. Yeah, I, I don't think they'll be able to make it. Or maybe an airlift with a chopper. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Instagram Soulstone too. He says Ferrari said they will never make an electric car. Ah, well. I remember reading about that, and we talked about that about three or four months ago. They, they said that they're going to see what the market does, and we kind of mocked them a little bit for that. Well, it depends on whether they get new leadership. Perhaps that, you know, I, I would imagine that would be an Enzo Ferrari type uh, culture statement because, yeah, yeah he, was, uh, he was an alpha male, and he definitely uh, did things his own way. And, uh, but yeah, it could be the death of Ferrari. I mean, obviously with, uh, you know, ice manufacturing coming to a screeching halt at some point in the future for Ferrari included. Um, and if you can't drive their cars on the road, what, uh, you know, where's their market? Well, yeah, exactly. And in, in 10 to 15 years, Ferrari might be making vehicles that are illegal to sell in the country where they're making them. Yeah. What will be interesting, too, is, you know, uh, some of these companies like McLaren, you know, the supercar companies, Ferrari, Lamborghini. They all made their name with cars that were clearly over the top and uh, that were engineering marvels. As the landscape for transportation continues to change, I'm curious who the new manufacturers that will emerge that will do things like, um, uh, you know, flying cars, for example. Yeah. Uh, with the drone type attachments on a car. 
um, because this whole thing could change drastically. And then how will that translate into extra performance? We're going to have the middle of the road commuter type vehicles in those categories. But how will these, these, these types of manufacturers distinguish themselves and create something over the top? That's going to be interesting. Well, it is, because how do you distinguish yourself when uh, the $2 million supercar of 10 years ago that had a 3.4 second zero to 60 was considered a supercar partly because they had a 3.4 second zero to 60? Yeah. Now I can go down to my local dealer and buy a stinking Volvo that has a 3.4 <laughs> right. second zero to 60. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that'll be an interesting transition uh, to see how that uh, eventually evolves. Yeah. So uh, Instagram crunch, uh, comment to Highlander, he says, uh, A, he says, California just approved a $7,500 EV credit on top of existing ones. What's Ohio thinking going the opposite way? Good question. That's a good question. I don't know. Instagram, Sebastian underscore you underscore official. Good job. Greetings from Germany. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, if you get a chance, tell us what part of Germany. I'm somewhat familiar with that being from there myself. Uh, and then on Instagram, uh, me missed dad me. Um, have you heard about adaptive headlights? You know, I have, but I can't put it, I can't quite put it together. Uh, is that the headlight that actually follows the road? Uh, that's part of what I've heard of with adaptive headlights. The ones that'll go high beam or low beam automatically will follow yeah. the curves of the road. Mm -hmm. So when you have a left-hand curve and the car senses that that curve is coming, it actually bends the headlights so that way. Mm -hmm. I have that on my, my Ford SUV. Um, I, I love the idea. I think there needs to be more of it. And I think it's the, uh, the 1960s era laws in the United States that have been holding everything back. Really? Yeah, that seems like it would widen the uh, safety margin quite a bit. Yes. Uh, YouTube Highlander Peril, he says, I'm sending you a 1957 popular science uh, magazine on alternative energy. Keep it. I memorized it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, years ago, uh, in fact, it was before I think the, um, uh, the Model S was released, I came across a 1960s National Geographic that was talking about the uh, space program, and I think it was the lunar landing. And I remember sending that to Elon, knowing that he was a SpaceX enthusiast. Instagram, Jash underscore C. Hello, explain VFD technology. So VFD is going to be variable frequency drive, and it's a type of motor controller, and I'm reading from Google here, mm -hmm. uh, that drives an electric motor by varying the frequency and voltage of its power supply. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know much about uh, VFD motors myself, though. Well, it's actually how the Tesla Roadster operates. It's a variable frequency drive uh, type process. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's... Uh, well, if it does that, then I'll bet that's how the Model S is driving as well, is with a VFD motor. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to research that and confirm that, but yeah, that's a good question. Instagram, Soulstone 2, they wouldn't be able to keep up with an electric Ferrari. That is true. <laughs> this Ferrari is not going to be going electric anytime soon, so I guess we uh -huh. won't have, have a chance to find out. You know, a uh, story that uh, came to me, and I didn't complete it uh, when we were talking about the, the new manufacturers. There's a guy that used to show up here at the uh, supercar uh, events, uh, Cars and Coffee here mm -hmm. locally in Scottsdale. And um, occasionally you would have the sports bikes show up. Uh, you never had the Harleys really show up, you know, the choppers with the leather jackets. But the sports um, bike guys would. And there was always one that uh, would show up periodically, and he actually had a jet powered sports bike and wow. it was the oddest thing when he started that thing up you would hear this uh spark gap go tick 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 and finally the engine would fire up and then you heard the swooshing sound and it smelled just like what you would get at an airport with a commercial jet liner firing you know the jet fuel yeah, burn yeah, odor yeah. type thing so that might be one of the advances in the future. Of course, we're not going to be able to use uh, after 2035 anything that uh, you know burns or has fossil fuel. But um, it's it's going to be improvements like that that may uh, end up uh, uh, you know changing cars in our future. 
it might be. And if I remember right, there's a there's a Circle K gas station, and now I haven't been there over in this tender area of town for a while. Uh, up in far northeast Phoenix, near Scottsdale, uh, it's like like 56th Street and Bell, and they sell racing fuel. You, mm -hmm. Anybody who wants yeah. to buy it can just drive up to the pump and get themselves racing fuel. Now, obviously, uh, getting 102 octane fuel in an engine that's designed for uh, 87 to 91 octane fuel is probably going to end up damaging your engine if you're not real careful. Yeah, there used to be a gas station, a Sunoco here in town, and before we went to the quarter mile drag strip, we would get the um, super premium at that gas station, which helped our quarter mile performance. Oh, sure, absolutely would. So it looks like Elon Musk is saying that Cybertruck's Tesla, um, or uh, Tesla Cybertruck, will be the best product ever. And uh, of course, the uh, truck is expected to hit the market by the end of this year. Two years behind schedule. Jesse, I've got some pictures here. The one that I found most interesting was you get to see the outside of the Cybertruck, but if you could bring up CT-3 and then CT-4, you can begin to see some of the interior of the truck. And I've never been close enough to one to be able to get into one or see one, at least not yet. But uh, there you can see it's a, it's a fairly uh, Spartan interior, not much frill. There we are in the back seat. Um, but definitely keep some of those angular lines that are on the outside and the backs of those seats. One of the things that uh, fascinates me there, and I, I, I hope to be able to sit in a Cybertruck someday, uh, look at the the shade, that blue shade on the uh, windshield. Oh, the windshield, yeah. That looks like that must be about 16 inches of blue shade, and it's there for legal reasons, the, the, uh, the highway safety... Uh, federal government is going to in, mandate that you don't have the sun coming right into your face at too high of an angle. I see. Okay. So a couple things I noticed, though. It's got the yoke steering wheel. Yeah. And then yeah. it also, is just me or does that dash look pretty plain? I don't see like any air conditioning vents even or anything. You know, they've gone to um, a very minimalistic design for things like vents that could just be a gap that runs the entire length of that dash. And then they also, in the later models, have voice commands, so you can actually tell it where you want to direct air. Pretty really? state-of-the-art stuff, yeah. That's cool. That's pretty cool. I've got another picture here. If I um, throw that up, let me see if I even put that up. No, I guess I didn't. I'm just going to read this to you then. It turns out that um, a couple of weeks ago, Tesla broke ground on their new lithium uh, refinery in Corpus Christi, Texas. It's 350 kilometers from Tesla's Austin Gigafactory. This must have been a European that wrote this because I'm the distance in mileage. Um, but uh, so anyway, Elon was there with Texas Governor Abbott, and uh, they brought some shovels on this cyber truck, and um, they broke ground on the largest EV battery-grade refinery in North America, which went fully operational next year, will be able to produce enough lithium ore for one million electric vehicles right here in the United States. So the uh, Cybertruck was there with shovels to, uh, for this event. And my understanding is that that, uh, that groundbreaking took place just this spring. It was uh, uh, early May, so it was late spring, early summer. Uh, that I, I think also that they're going to be able to, when the factory is done and fully up to speed, support over a million electric vehicles manufactured with the number of batteries that they're going to put out of that factory. Amazing, huh? Yeah, it, it really is. Of course, you've got the factory down in Mexico as well as the Texas Gigafactory for them to support. So um, between the two, Elon has stated a goal that he wants to have well over a million cars between those two factories coming out every year as well. And if I remember right, the Texas, uh, not the Texas, the Mexico Gigafactory is uh, slated to eventually have over a million cars a year just coming out of it. Exciting. Um, Instagram, Soulstone 2, he, call, uh, he says it's a turbine motorcycle. Yes, thumbs up. Then uh, Soulstone 2 also says motorcycles use helicopter engines. And I do remember the owner saying something about that. Is it because they're, well, probably because they're small enough. Yeah, probably because they're small enough. I've uh, One of the engines on a helicopter will sit up near where the blades are. 
And so it is well suited for motorcycle use where it's a fairly long and thin engine. Mm -hmm. Um, Highlander Perils has been waiting for you to talk about variable frequency drives. Now for PLCs, I'm pretty darn good at them. 30 years plus will do that. So it looks like he's got experience with that. Thank Great. you for sharing. Yeah, we'll definitely need to uh, go more into that in the ne near term future. The um, last podcast that we did, the EV podcast, was Tuesday, and um, we touched on this uh, Lucid update, the financial analysis update. And uh, we posted a few of those uh, excerpts from that podcast on some Facebook sites. And I wanted to read you one of the, um, uh, the comments from one of the top contributors on the uh, Lucid Owners site on Facebook. And he says, um, and he's talking about the podcast, he says, this video provides a wealth of valuable insights um, that uh, covers topics like Tesla, Lucid, batteries, charging, and industry changes. These presenters are quite professional, and their engaging tone of voice adds to the enjoyment of listening. I highly recommend a watch. That was a that's, nice compliment. That's a pretty high compliment. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give another teaser on what the video on Lucid is going to be about. You know, we're talking about whether it's close to collapse or not. Uh, I'm not going to give the final, the final piece of that. Uh, on one side of that argument is uh, things that we recognize that Lucid has a demand problem. They've been producing more cars for a number of quarters than they have been selling, or based on what their financial data says that they've been doing that. Uh, but on the other hand, Lucid has some large scale uh, sales to help uh, uh, support the company. The Saudi Arabians uh, have, have a contract with Lucid to provide 50,000 cars over 10 years. And that contract has a clause in it for the Saudi Arabian government to have another 50,000 cars over that same time period. So it could be a sale of 100,000 cars, which is similar to what the lifeline is that was thrown to Rivian when Amazon signed on to buy 100,000 delivery vans. Also, um, Lucid has what uh, in sales terms is called a bluebird. They have the sale with Aston Martin where they're going to be providing drivetrain and battery technology. Overall, the deal is valued about $450 million. I don't see a time frame yet. However, uh, Aston Martin is hoping to have their EV, which they're going to develop with Lucid's help, mm -hmm. out within the next three years. So I think it's reasonable that this could be in that same time frame. Um, the reason this is a bluebird is that this type of thing, this type of uh, sale and the manufacturing that goes on behind it has never been in any sales projections. Mm -hmm. It's totally one of those out of the blue type of uh, sales items that it's been, it's inked, it's signed, sealed and delivered. So uh, come watch the video when it comes out. Oh. And there will be more about those types of things, and we'll come some uh, draw some conclusions ourselves as to whether we think Lucid's close to collapse or how close they would be. And you know, um, without giving away too much from the video, um, and I'll and I'll leave that as a teaser. The thing that impressed me the most was uh, based on your research, aside from the Saudi PIF fund, what the investor profile looked like. And oh I think yeah, that, that was... was the most revealing to me that there's. Uh, that there's something here that needs to be paid attention to. You know, that was really amazing. We were mentioning that on Tuesday, actually, mm -hmm. so I don't mind mentioning that again here as we're getting ready to close up. Um, of the top 25 owners, uh, you take out the Saudi PIF fund, they own 60% of Lucid stock, so you got 24 owners. 20 of those top 24 owners are investment grade funds. And, and I'm talking the vanguards and the Merrill Lynch's of the world that are that are investing in Charles Lucid. Schwab, yes, yeah, Charles Schwab, uh, the largest teachers union in the United States. Uh, they have their own investment fund that has X number of billions of dollars that they invest. They're invested in Lucid, and when Lucid had their recent capital uh, capitalization stock offering, basically where they raised $3 billion in additional cash, 19 of those 20 owners bought more Lucid stock. Right. No one dumped. No one ran for the hills. No one yeah. ran for the hills. Right. Uh, the only person who, who didn't buy uh, held. They didn't sell. Mm -hmm. And so all 20 of them at least kept their holdings 
and uh, 19 of the 20 bought more loose stock. That, to me, uh, said an awful lot. It did. You know, it looks like we're coming to the end of our uh, hour and a half podcast here. YouTube Highlander Peril says, yep, best podcast. Uh, thank you for that vote of confidence. Our next podcast is going to be next week, Tuesday, mm -hmm. and then Wednesday we do the Roadster podcast, and Thursday we've got the um, uh, the EV podcast and, again. And don't forget the Sunday AI podcast yeah, that you and Jesse do. <laughs> <laughs> and tomorrow, Gruber Power. Yeah, we are gathering some great material. Tomorrow it'll be the Gruber Power, and uh, they're going to be talking about a project they did where uh, the Arizona Department of Transportation actually shut down part of a major highway so that we could service an uninterruptible power system in a tunnel just east of here. Um, we've got uh, drone footage and uh, some more detail about how that went. And then as uh, was pointed out, Sunday we've got our AI podcast, and every week it seems like there's new AI stuff coming along that just kind of uh, rivets you to, uh, you it know, it uh, catches your attention. So, again, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate our audience. Uh, one final question, alternative energy. Auto, oh, um, from... Uh, okay. Atiyaroa. I learned how to pronounce it from... He says so, it better than I do. Atiyaroa Kia Ora from Atiyaroa, which is New Zealand. New Zealand. Thank Welcome. you for joining us. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us. I know it's very early morning for you guys. Um, look forward to talking to you guys again this next week, and take care.